Okay, friends, welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm Judy Clem with Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, we are delighted to welcome you as we learn about growing onions with our um, guest tonight. Um, Zach is going to um, share a nice program with us. Um, so as you know, as part of the Friends mission, we want to help inspire gardeners and educate them so that they're more confident in their gardening endeavors. And um, so this year, we began the year off with um, a fantastic seed swap and seed starting lecture. That was in person at the conservatory. And so it wasn't recorded. It's not on our website, but we had a fantastic turnout and our speaker was terrific. And um, I think next year we will continue to do that program in January. And I believe we'll bring that lecture as an online program so it can be recorded and then more people can attend at their leisure. Coming up after this um, nice program tonight, looking ahead, we have the spring series coming. It's called Learn and Grow. And we will have back-to-back -back programs uh, three weeks in a row in April, April 3rd, April 10th, and then the 17th and um, a different topic each day, getting us ready for planting season and leading into our big annual plant sale. So those are some things to watch for. Uh, I do want to mention our plant help desk is now open every Wednesday. And um, you can call, email, drop by on Wednesdays from 1 to 3 p.m. And we will have a volunteer who may or may not be a master gardener, but we will have a volunteer expert who can answer your plant questions, um, you can bring in a plant to get it repotted for free. This is a service that we're providing to the community in conjunction with our partners and staff at the Oak Park Conservatory. And so on Wednesdays from one to three, please do um, tell your friends to come in and take advantage of our plant help desk. So um, now it is my great pleasure to introduce our special guest, um, Zach Bell Grant. Um, is joining us. He is a local foods and small farms extension educator housed in Cook County Unit 6. He joined the extension in 2015 to focus on urban ag agriculture production programming for a diverse group of stakeholders. Zach educates, conducts research, and provides technical assistance in small-scale, intensive, and urban ag food production systems in the Chicagoland region and beyond. He's also currently conducting ongoing demonstration and applied research in urban agriculture production at a quarter acre South Suburban Cook Urban Agriculture Demonstration and Research Site known as Sosuko. I hope I got all that right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Zach, uh, you'll tell us more. Zach holds a BS in agribusiness horticulture from Illinois State University and an MS in horticulture from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He resides in um, and owns a 20 acre farm in Kankakee County, where he's developing small, um, various small farm projects. So um, Zach is here tonight. I do wanna also introduce Casey Nikoloff. She is our um, co-host with me and she will manage the chat and handle the Q&A at the end. And if we have a cozy group, um, we could probably um, open it up for questions um, directly. And so let's just kind of see um, how things go. Because if we keep it um, small, I bet we could just uh, raise our hands and ask Zach some questions afterwards. So without further ado, I am turning it over to Zach for the presentation. Great. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. Um, I need to, uh, I think I need to edit the bio just a little bit, but I, it, it's, it's always funny hearing it back after you've uh, written it and, and, and sent it and heard it a few times, but it's been a while. So I appreciate the intro and I, I just want to say hi to everybody. And th this is an image. If you're wondering the screenshot behind me, uh, is my screenshot saver for zoom. And then that, and that is the Sosuko urban egg demonstration farm. I'll show you some images of that here in my intro. Uh, but I just wanted to say hi but I'm gonna turn off my video while I do the presentation because I'm actually gonna be rotating to this other screen that I have on and that, it'll save me a little bandwidth. But when we get to the Q&A section at the end, I'll, I'll turn my uh, camera back on so you can see my smiling face. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump in. 
So I, I've titled tonight's presentation all about aliens. So you can see that I also am not only a, a fan of, of talking about the alien family, which is the onion family, uh, but I'm also a big fan of alliteration. So I, I actually borrowed that from a colleague of mine at Michigan State University, Dr. John Bierenbaum, who's also a, a big a fan and advocate of alliteration. And, and he has a, a fact sheet that he titled all about aliens. So I had I had to borrow that from him uh, uh, because I, I I truly love it. And I, and I really actually truly am uh, thrilled to be able to talk about this single topic. I, I was, uh, before everyone hopped on our Master Urban Farmer training program, and a lot of our programs are very kind of big system focused uh, when we help farmers build from the ground up these uh, production systems that they try to implement uh, with their farming operations. So I very rarely get to talk about a single topic like this. And I've been actually accumulating a lot of pictures uh, over the past year since I was invited to do this talk. kind of, and, and so I'll be showcasing you firsthand a lot of my personal uh, production experience with growing onions in particular. And these are uh, two varieties I'll, I'll mention at the end. This is a uh, Rosa de Milano on the left-hand side and Patterson, uh, which is a, a red and, and yellow storage onion respectively. Um, we'll talk a little bit about varieties at, at the very end of the presentation. Uh, but uh, the past is definitely prologue, so I just want to really briefly uh, give you a little bit more context about my background. I'm just going to fly through this because th that was a wonderful introduction. So here is kind of my my origin story when it comes to uh, diversified vegetable production. And I didn't grow up, even though I live and work on a farm or own a farm right now uh, and train small farmers, I didn't grow up on a farm. And in fact, most of my passion for uh especially crop or, or vegetable production came from gardening, from growing food in my backyard, which is probably very similar to your passion. So this is me back in the summer of 1999 at my first kind of garden project in, in when I moved out of the dorms for the first time. And right away, my passion, if, if any of you know uh, what that box is that I'm planting into, that's not, actually not a raised bed. That's a kind of a traditional uh, what we call lighted Dutch style cold frame, where we I built a kind of slightly slanted box that I uh, used to repurpose storm windows to kind of cover to make a, a you know a miniature kind of old fashioned cold frame device. And that passion kind of led me to my graduate work at the University of Illinois, where I studied uh, intensive year round winter vegetable production systems. So we can build these unheated passively solar greenhouses that we call high tunnels or hoop houses. I'm sure some of you are familiar with these structures uh, and actually grow year round. So I focused a lot of my research attention on uh, these winter production systems. But then subsequently, I stayed on with the university after grad school. Uh, and I was managing and directing this project for about seven years before I came on with Extension. And this is known as the Sustainable Student Farm Project, which is a seven-acre year-round diversified vegetable production farm that's housed on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana-Champaign. So with this project, we you know grew uh, a bunch of different vegetables. We sold them back to the dining hall units. Uh, as well as we did some farm stand kind of direct sales to the university uh, public, but we used it as kind of a teaching and demonstration farm and as well as conducting research. So um, we, we held classes there, uh, beginning farmer training classes, uh, and I did, did a lot of demonstration and research at the farm itself. And that kind of led me to my work with Extension because Extension, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is, is really the kind of cooperating extension of the land grant university. So it was founded in um, 1914, the Extension Service, and it was meant to take the, the research and technology innovations that were happening at the University of Illinois, which when it started was actually an agriculture and mechanic mechanical college. So all of the knowledge that was being developed there needed to be transferred to the community of farmers that, that was, were gonna benefit from that information. And that's how the Extension Service started. So now here in, in 2024, uh, Extension actually has a lot, lot of different uh, programmatic sort of disciplines, including nutrition and wellness. 4-H um, is heavily connected to agriculture. There's even STEM education. Uh, but my focus and passion still is in agriculture and in these really small scale intensive, uh, particularly vegetable production system. So, so that led me to transition from working on this sort of mechanized kind of what I call medium scale vegetable production on that kind of 10 to 15 acres to Cook County to focus on urban agriculture projects where, you know, we deal with anywhere from you know, backyard urban homesteaders, maybe like yourself, all the way up to, you know, one, two, three acre diversified urban uh, farms in urban areas. 
And here I'm just kind of illustrating two things. One is that on the left-hand side, you can see me as an extension educator out there in the public with our first cohort of the Master Urban Farmer Training Program. But on the right-hand side, that's actually my 3,000 square foot um, market garden project at my home farm. So I, I blend not only the sort of theoretical sort of research knowledge and applied research that I conduct, but I also combine it with practical experience. My my favorite agrarian writer, Wendell Berry, uh, once said in this quote, he said that that problems need to be solved in work and in place by those that will suffer the consequences of those mistakes. And it was actually a critique of the land grant institutions and, and institutions in general for not being connected to the land and being connected uh, to the work that they were teaching and doing research. And so I, I, I flipped that on its head. And, and for me, you know, growing food uh, is a passion as well as teaching, learning and researching about it and sharing that knowledge. So um, that that really is kind of my background. Uh, I, I do have a home farm, a 20 acre farm, but we my uh, domestic partner Angie and I, we we just live here and actually just kind of do stuff like you see here in these images. We don't actually have any commercial ventures at the farm at this time um, because I am so busy with my work project. So we do have this research and demonstration farm we call Sosuko. This is in the South Suburban uh, Cook community of Matson, Illinois, where my extension office is. And this is about a quarter acre site. And we do all sorts of diversified uh, year round vegetable production here. Where and we donate all this produce. We donate about four to five thousand pounds of this produce to food pantries that are connected to our SNAP education teams. And I conduct uh, all sorts of demonstration projects as well as applied research projects. So the image that you just saw in my background, this is that image of the demo site. Um, we even do lots of kind of unique little projects, like we're involved with um, some variety trial work with the the cannabis floral CBD project when when uh, floral CBD was legalized. Um, we started doing some work with that as a kind of a specialty crop. We're actually going to be doing some ginger and turmeric work uh, at our demonstration high tunnel this year to kind of, it's it's long been known that you can do turmeric and ginger in these unheated greenhouse systems in the Midwest, but we want to explore a little bit more how to adapt them to like these unique kind of horticultural growing conditions. Uh, continue a lot of my winter production work. And I can share with you a vlog at the end, some of my Instagram and vlog channel on YouTube, where I kind of share a uh, little educational videos and tidbits from this site a little bit later. Uh, my, I have an applied research background in agriculture, so I do some actual applied replicated research work here. I have a lot of interest in uh, soil fertility as, as it relates to urban agriculture and spe specifically because there's such a unique uh, sort of growing conditions of urban agriculture where we're using imported soils, custom-made soils, heavy compost inputted soils. It's really kind of a unique fertility system when we're starting to do a lot of work uh, focused on that, as well as kind of some of the traditional work that Extension is known for, mainly things like variety trial work. So, you know, I've been doing for the past three years, and I very soon will have this published in a fact sheet, uh, this what we call hybrid heirloom tomato uh, variety trial work. So these are kind of common, you know, hybrids of traditional heirloom varieties that so many home gardeners and homesteaders love, as well as, you know, market farmers. But it combines it with, you know, hybrid um, gene pools to create these kind of, you know, hybrids, essentially, but they they have all the qualities of heirloom. So we've been trialing these for several years in our high tunnel, and I'll have some of that uh, information published soon here. And last but not least, before we get into the program, I do our Hallmark program that I conduct is called the Master Urban Farmer Training Program. So you can see the branding in the bottom right hand corner. This is a 12 week program we offer once a year, and it really focuses on urban production systems. And it, we do have urban homesteaders that that take the training, but it, we tend to try to get more focused on folks who are interested in kind of scaled up urban agriculture. So, you know, multiple thousand square footage up to acre, quarter acre size uh, urban farm projects. Um, so I, more information about that, if you're interested in that, I can share that at the very end. Okay, so let's jump into this conversation about onions. So I titled it all about alliums because I wanted to give a brief retrospective on the entire family group, the onion family group, alliums. So onions, garlics, leeks are kind of the, the main uh, focuses in there. But things like walking or Egyptian onions, um, the alium sepa variety proliferum, as well as the herb family of chives, so both chives and garlic chives 
all fit within the onion family as well. So we're only, we're primarily going to focus on kind of the sweet storage onion family tonight, but you can kind of group green onions or scallions, at least with cultural practices within the onion family. And you'll kind of see why that is in a little bit. Um, and I will just very briefly talk about garlic and leeks. I, I don't want to, those could probably be their own separate presentation, uh, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention them because when it comes to the alien family, if you're going to grow onions, you might as well throw in garlic at the very least, but leeks, maybe if you have a passion for leeks, leeks are at least culinarily in the kitchen, maybe more of a, a minor crop uh, versus garlic and onions that most of us who cook readily and love onions use on a daily basis. So I'll briefly mention those two things, just briefly, if you have some curiosity to peek it, but the rest of it, we're gonna just focus on, on the onion family, okay? So with leeks, the, the kind of critical thing is, and I'll, I'll put this little, um, I have this little stop motion video. I have a few of these videos I'll, I'll kind of show you tonight. Um, if any of us haven't grown leeks, leeks seem like a challenging crop to grow, but they're very similar to growing green onions and scallions. The, the key differentiator, though, is that you need to plant them deep. So you need some sort of, in this case, in the stop motion video, you can see I have a nine inch um, dibbler. So you can use that after you do your bed prep to make your deep holes. This picture on the top right hand corner, that T-handle you see, that's actually a soil testing probe. So anything that you, you could use maybe the end of the handle, it depends on how, uh, what the bulk density or sort of, you know, structure of your soil is. If you can easily kind of create a nine to 10 inch hole in your bed, then that's really all you need to do. Um, once you get your planting uh, diagram kind of laid out on the soil, uh, the leeks here, these are the leek transplants in, in the middle picture. And I tend to, I actually grow them it's one of the only transplants that I grow in an open flat. Everything else I usually either, I traditionally will do soil blocking or I use some sort of um, a plug tray that I'll, you'll, I think you'll see a couple examples of that um, a little bit later. But I do grow, uh, and you can grow your bulb onions this way too, uh, but there's just a little bit of risk of damping off if you use these open containers. So if, if you have any sort of damping off pathogens that come into play, if you don't have the the containers uh, to kind of you know block off the spread of that, that can be a problem. But if you're not concerned about it, you can very easily grow them in an open flat and handle them roughly. One of the themes of plants in the alien family is that you can handle them very roughly. You can take you know clumps of plants, rip them apart, throw them against the wall, and and it's they're really they're going to be no worse for the wear. Uh, that isn't the case with transplants and other uh, vegetable families, but it certainly is in the alien family. So here you can see they're they're very thin uh, when they're at that stage, um, but I just simply uh, pull them apart and, and you just plant them kind of deep into these holes that you can see in the stop motion video. And the key is you want it to look like this leak in the bottom left hand picture. And then of course, the reason why you plant them so deep is to get a wonderful blanch. So this is a, a, a picture I took that I sent to Angie and I, I wrote that little comment in there, look at this blanch, because I was so excited at how deep I was able to get that blanch almost all the way up to where the uh, the leaves begin at the top of the leak. Uh, so that's it. with leaks, that's kind of what you want to do. Um, and so you can kind of start them very much the same as you will. Some of the other onions we're going to talk about here in a minute but you just need to plant them deep. That's kind of the critical differentiator between a scallion, let's say. Now, garlic, some of us maybe have experience with garlic. The garlic is one of my favorite crops to grow. And it, you can, you know, the same thing with aliens. Once you get good at it, depending on how much space you have, you can make a pretty big dent in your annual use and supply of garlic and onions if you have the right storage conditions. And I'll talk about it th that at the end. Typically, though, the, the deal with garlic, if you haven't done it before, is that you want to plant it in the fall uh, in, in at this latitude. Uh, so that means typically we're planting it in kind of mid to late October. And the further you go north, I guess, you know, in Chicago, kind of Oak Park region, you can probably get away with planting it towards the end of October, maybe even first week in November. But you don't want to plant it too early because if you plant it too early, then you're going to get some, you know, vegetative growth and above ground growth that you you want to kind of make sure happens more in the spring, like around this time, uh, versus in the fall. But you know, there's a it's a there's a pretty forgiving window with it. Uh, so it's typically fall planting. Can be it can be planted in the spring, 
but when you plant it in the spring, the bulbs tend to be smaller and you just don't get the full size heads uh, that you would with fall planted garlic. So I have heard of some people who do kind of like an overwinter transplant of a garlic where they will start it in pots like in the winter and then they'll grow it up to a decent size and then plant those transplants out in the spring. But I also think there is something having to do with the chill hours as that relates to the bulb formation. And so I just recommend that you plant in the fall uh, if you can. And, you know, again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about garlic tonight, but it, it deserves its own uh, presentation if you're interested in it. Uh, and I'd be happy to, to discuss that more with you at a later date. So what I want to focus on for the rest of the time is Allium sepa, which is the, the onion family, essentially the bulb onion family. Again, I'm just going to let scallions or green onions tag along for the ride because with the cultural practices, they're virtually the same. The only difference is that with scallions and green onions, there isn't bulb formation that's initiated like you see in this picture of this uh, Sierra Blanc white onion in this right hand picture. Uh, onions, you know, historically are, are really fascinating. They, they're sort of, origin story comes from kind of that Eurasian Mediterranean region is where they originated from, where they're initially domesticated. But there's been dig sites where they found onions, particularly in China, as far back as 7,000 BC. So we're pushing about 10,000 years of onion cultivation, which puts onions pretty much at the beginning of the advent of agriculture as, as a society you know, begins with. So onions have a long story history um, you know, and, and obviously to this day, humanity, you know, depends on the onions for its cooking attributes, you know, as well as historically, it had a lot of medicinal properties that were relied on uh, during ancient times and antiquity. And now we can actually apply science to understand the insights to what those medicinal properties are. And, and that has everything to do with these organo sulfur compounds. So that's a really simple way of kind of framing the the numerous secondary plant metabolite sulfur containing compounds that onions has and that's that's where we're getting the odor from so the for some people repulsive odor of onions relates to these compounds but it's also responsible for the uh the secondary plant metabolite quality so when i say secondary plant metabolites those are usually things that aren't you know carbohydrates proteins fats that the plants developed uh, for other things. And primarily from a plant's perspective, the meta those secondary metabolites are for plant defense. And they're usually involved some sort of pungent, repulsive sulfur containing compounds. But it just so happens that those compounds also have tremendous medicinal and pharmaceutical properties like, uh, you know, anti-inflammatory, antibiotic, anti-carcinogenic compounds. And there's been a lot of body of research that focuses it on that. And the onion family is, is no stranger to that. Uh, a lot of them are biennials. So that means you you grow it one year. I'm sure most of us know what a biennial is. Um, and they don't flower until the following year. So they overwinter. The chai family actually is perennial and will come back year to year. But most of the alliums that we're concerned about as horticulturists, we treat them as annual crops. So we very rarely actually get them to overwinter. If you do want to overwinter, the, the flower of an onion is really beautiful if you if you've never overwintered onions and actually uh, got one to flower it creates this wonderful almost fist size uh, bulb flower that that puts out these purple rosettes that's that's really pretty to see. Uh, full sun is always best with onions, green onions and maybe chives can withstand a little bit of shading, but if you want to get that bulb formation, you need full sun. OK, it is a cool season crop, but it really does require a lot of sun, a lot of photosynthesis and a long growing season in order to initiate that bulb formation. And the last thing I'll mention here about cultural requirements on this slide is that moisture requirements are very high for onions. The onion family is very shallowly rooted. In fact, those onions that we cut off when we when we clean them for cooking, they don't extend much further than that. Uh, the root system does not go as deep as, you know, tomatoes, sweet corn, any other deep rooted vegetables we grow. So, you know, you're really limited to that top six inches of water holding capacity for your soil. So if you're growing in a raised bed that drains and dries out quickly, you really need to have a consistent moisture supply to be successful with growing onions. So that will likely mean some sort of drip irrigation, overhead irrigation, 
uh, system integrated. And if you've had trouble growing onions uh, because you don't have a good irrigation set up, then that could be one of your first steps that you might want to think about. Okay, so some of the, the the main other cultural considerations with onions is that they can be grown in a variety of different ways, okay? So you can grow onions from seeds. You can start them directly in the ground in, in a bed. You can grow them as transplants, which is what I'm kind of going to kind of mainly focus on and, and encourage you to kind of explore. They can also be grown as, in what are called sets or small bulbs. And I will reference this at the very end when it comes to uh, bridging the onion gap full circle in an, in an annual production season uh, with overwintered onions. And, and there's a, a particular variety called Forum that, that a lot of uh, companies sell bulb sets from that are easy to get. But I would in primarily encourage you to focus on sets if you want to plant them in the fall when you plant your garlic and attempt to protect them and overwinter them for early spring onions. That's where sets really come into play. You absolutely, if you go to the garden center or at your plant sales, if you get your hands on some uh, small onion sets, you can set them out in the spring. But when it comes to variety selection, it, it's, it's harder to find a variety of different onion species in set form. You, you primarily need to acquire seeds and either direct seed them or start them as transplants. And that that's what I want you to primarily try to focus on. So when it comes to direct seeding, you can get them in the ground. And, and, and this is one of those crops when you look at uh, gardening books or you read planting charts that say, as soon as possible in the spring or whenever the ground can be worked, which typically in our hardiness zone, uh, kind of 5B through 7A now with the updated hardiness zone maps means kind of mid to end of March through early April. Now, what I would recommend, and this is what I've done for over 15 years of growing onions, is I start all of my onions as transplants, okay? And and I just and the timing of this works out perfectly for this presentation because today is the day that I started my very first onion transplant. You may, you know, see other gardeners on Instagram talking about maybe they started their onions three or four weeks ago, or maybe even you know in January. That's fine. But typically what's worked well for most long day onions that I'm gonna describe in more detail in a second is to start them anywhere from early February to the first week in March. If you can get your seeds started then, you're gonna get that good six to eight weeks of seedling growth that you need before those transplants are ready to be set out, okay? And what this is gonna do for you is if, if you don't already know as a, as a transplant grower or user of transplants, uh, is that you get a head start on the season you, really by growing transplants and uh, you know or, or purchasing the plants from a plant sale uh, you really do get a two to three week head start on anything that you direct seed in the garden uh, of equivalency right um and that's reflected in this days to maturity at the bottom here so typically if you look at a seed packet with onions it'll say anywhere from 100 to 110 days to maturity and that is from seed. So that would be from planting in the ground uh, and germination all the way through bulb formation and harvest would be about 100 days. Now, if you count that from a transplant that you set out in the garden, you can subtract anywhere from about two weeks to three weeks off of that. So when you set the transplant, like you see here in this picture out in the, in the garden bed, you can rely on maybe about 80 to 85 days to maturity for a bulb onion and maybe about you know, 45, 50, 60 days uh, for a scallion as an example. So if you have the space, the time, the setup, I recommend starting onions as transplants and scallions as transplants as well. And if you're wondering why they're planted in this weird pattern that you see in this picture, I'm gonna explain all that in a second because my preferred way of growing both scallions and onions is what we call in a multi-seeded, multi-plant block system, okay? And, I, and I'll explain that as, as we get through that here. So here's just, you know, you've probably seen, this is our older extension uh, vegetable planting date chart. Here, if you look here, they recommend seeds uh, for long day onions in the garden. They're giving you a window of, of anywhere from March through June, which this sheet really needs to be updated. Uh, but that is for the most part true. Um, they're recommending onion sets in the garden, April 1st through April 25th. Again, more or less true. Um, right now, this is actually the current guidance. We, we do have some updated planting date charts that are reflected in 
the hardiness zone updates. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the USDA updating their hardiness zones, not once, but twice in the past 10 years. So if you remember, this was updated back in 2012 to reflect that previous 30 year data set of average winter temperatures. But they did some modeling and decided that that they needed to update it one more time. And if, for those of you who have who looked at the hardiness zones, we now see that that bubble that doesn't maybe quite maybe is close to extending to Oak Park, but that bubble that we traditionally thought about just extending from the lake into downtown Chicago used to be hardiness zone six B or six A. Now that is put in hardiness zone seven A, which is the same hardiness zone as Southern Illinois, almost the Northern part of Kentucky. And pretty much the rest of Cook County is now in hardiness zone six B. So, you know, as, as the winters get warmer on average, which we won't have any sort of comment or conversation about what's causing that, but we can all probably guess what that might be. Um, the hardiness zones are, are gonna maybe be shifting over the next few decades even more. Um, so in this case, Northern Illinois planting guide for onion bulbs or green onion, they're saying sets. They're giving you this kind of April 9th to May 15th planting range. I would use the Central Illinois planting guide, which I have here as well, um, which is more in that kind of March 25th to May 1st range. So again, that could be direct seeding in the garden, but I would encourage you to start transplants now and maybe seek to get those, those onion transplants out planted in the garden, you know, sometime between the middle of April to the first week of May. And you're going to probably have a lot better results if you do that uh, versus direct seeding right into the garden. Because, you know, it, it's great to be able to plant cool season crops as early as you can now outside if you can plant in your beds now. But, you know, the ideal media soil temperature for onions is around 78 to 80 degrees. Uh, and when, when is when is the soil temperature going to be uh, that that warm? That's not going to happen until August. So part of the reason why I like studying transplants is because you can control the media conditions indoors. So right now I have my my first flat that I started on a heat bench under my lights, and that media is going to slowly get warmed up to about 80 degrees. And that's going to give me good germination probably in about four to five days. And then the onions are going to be on their way. OK. So in terms of uh, planting for a continuous supply, the nice thing about bulb onions is that you really only need to plant once. If you plan out your a section of the garden where you want to have your onion supply, you only need to get you know planting in once and get that to maturity, and then you can have them as storage for a decent period of time. With scallions, it's a little bit different because scallions, you know, mature at about fifty to sixty days from transplants. If you wait too long from one scallion planting, they start to get thick and big and you can still eat them, but they're not the same eating quality as when they're kind of small and kind of pencil size. So you may want to consider planting scallions multiple times in the spring season. So that's what we call a succession planting. And in this case, this chart's recommending maybe planting every three weeks for a continuous supply. So I, I tend to try to maybe do one to three scallion plantings throughout a season in order to have a, a more continuous supply of like the pencil size uh, scallions. All right, here's where we get where the rubber hits the road with the onions. And this is where maybe there's always been some confusion with you if you've ever tried to go grow onions. And that is the day length requirements for bulb onions. And this applies only to bulb onions. It doesn't apply to anything in the onion family that doesn't bulb out like an onion does. So not only do they require the full sun that I referenced earlier, but they are super sensitive to day length and it fits into roughly three categories. There's long day bulb onions, there's intermediate day bulb onions. And then finally there's the short day bulb onions. And these are tend to be the sweeter onions. So if you've heard of Vidalia or Walla Walla onions, those are more, more likely grown. You hear about them. They come from Georgia or the South and that's because they're intermediate or short day onions that are grown Typically, starting in the fall, they're overwintered and harvested in the late spring um, for consumption. And you can grow intermediate and short day varieties at the northern latitudes where we're at here. You're just never going to get the the full size um, of the bulb that you're going to get at the at the further south latitudes. So, in general, for starters with growing onions, I would recommend sticking to what we call long day 
ball long day varieties. And so that they require 14 hours or more day length to initiate that bulb formation. And that typically begins around the end of May to early June at, at this latitude. So that's why, you know, starting your seedlings now, getting them growing for about six to eight weeks, putting them out in mid to late April to get them established. And then they immediately start bulb formation kind of the end of April, early May, and then you're harvesting sometime in July, August, into September. What I really quickly I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, swap screens here, and I'm going to show you a website. So this is actually a, a link to Johnny Selected Seeds website. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Johnny's. Uh, wonderful company, and buy a lot of seeds from them and equipment. Don't advocate for them, but they, 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 one of the things I love about John is that they have a wonderful educational grower library resource. So I'll go ahead and pop this in the chat box really quick. Uh, so this is the link to this page if you want to check this out later. And what this is, is a page all about onions. And you can see over here on the left hand side, they have all sorts of information. You can click on all of these and go into way more depth than we can go into tonight. But what I want to do is just scroll down to kind of show you their charts that they have for long day, intermediate day, and short day onions. And you can kind of see geographically what I what I mean in terms of latitude. So with long day onions, you can see here, they have this nice graph. These are the ones that they're best suited at about 37 to 47 degrees north latitude, which is firmly all of Illinois. So any onion variety that's in that long day uh, category works really well here. And these tend to be the onions that there's a lot of diversity in flavor and pungency, but these tend to be, you know, more storage onions that have slightly more pungent flavor that store really, really well. Now the intermediate uh, day onions and the short day onions tend to be the kind of sweeter onions that, that we might think of as kind of the sweeter cooking onions. Again, they can be grown at this latitude, but you're just never going to get the same bulb formation that you would uh, growing them for a longer period of time, starting in the winter and that bulb initiation happens in the fall and over winters and carries on in, into the spring. Okay. So I just wanted to show you this page because this is an excellent resource if you want to dive deeper uh, into onions and, and they have, you know, obviously lots of great onion varieties you can purchase from them. You can purchase transplants from them and they do have one variety of onions that you can purchase. And that's that variety forum that I referenced. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the very end. In fact, probably at the, the very last slide. So that's kind of the basic for the the the, the cultural considerations with onions to, for starters. One thing, I, I have a lot of info here. We're not going to cover all this. Um, and I, in fact, I can. this is being recorded, but I could send you a PDF of this uh, to the group later so you can reference this. And I just kind of did the math here for you. Um, just because this is one of the things that I, I really focus and specialize in is, is soil fertility. Uh, so really with onions, they really do require well-drained soils. And if the higher the organic matter, the better. So raised beds actually work really well. This is actually a, a partner farm that we work with in Chicago, uh, Precious Blood Ministry. And this is they have about an 8,000 square foot kind of donation garden farm project. And they do everything in raised beds on blacktop services. And you can see here that they have this wonderful bulb formation. Um, and I believe they do uh, buy transplants and, and, and space them out at about a two inch spacing um, in order to get this nice bulb formation that you see here. Um, so this is if you direct seeded them in rows and then you thin them out to like about one to two inch spacing, this is what you would get. So remember this visual when we look at uh, some of the different methods a little bit later. Um, again, as is the case with all vegetables, I can't I can't emphasize this enough. You should base any macro or micronutrient needs on a soil test. So while the university doesn't do the soil testing directly at our land grant institute, we certainly can either if you want to do it, initiate that through the help desk with the friends of Oak Park or directly through definitely, you know, help you out interpreting your soil test. Uh, if you get the when you get the results back. But one thing I want to emphasize here is that nitrogen is something that isn't really frequently tested for on a standard traditional soil test, which means that nitrogen is something that should be a part of your annual fertilization program for any crop that you're growing. And when it comes to onions, they actually require a lot of nitrogen. So on average, the recommendation for our commercial growers is almost 200, the equivalent of 200 pounds 
of actual nitrogen per acre for onion crops. And what I've done here is I, I kind of broke all that down so I could get you to a number that's easier for us to understand for backyard growing. And that's about the, the pounds of nitrogen you need for 100 square feet. So I did all the math here. We don't have time to go over this because, and what I do want to emphasize here is that there, there should be a little bit more thought and planning when it comes to nitrogen because it's the most limited nutrient and we want to be careful with the amount of nitrogen that we use because, you know, we don't want to over apply nitrogen. Okay. And I'm being very kind of source neutral here uh, in terms of whether you're using an organic source of nitrogen, like a blood meal that I'm giving an example here at the bottom or something like ammonium sulfate or ammonium or um, uh, potassium sulfate or, or any sort of conventional kind of quote unquote synthetic nitrogen source. The key though, is that nitrogen management is critical if you want to get your maximized yield and bulb formation for the onions, but you don't want to get too crazy. So that's why I'm giving you an example of how to kind of stepwise approach how you put your nitrogen plan together for the year. Okay. Ultimately, what it comes down to is figuring out, you know, what that 190 pounds per acre is on a square footage basis. And it actually adds up to about 0.4 pounds of nitrogen per 100 square feet. I usually add on about 20% to account for, you know, soil mineralization deficits, leaching, and that comes out to about a half pound of nitrogen per 100 square feet. This is where it gets a little complicated and again, I don't want to lose you here, but with nitrogen, the other critical thing is that you don't want to apply it all at once, especially if you need to apply a lot of nitrogen. And typically what we, how we um, solve that is what we call a split application, meaning that of that 0.53 pounds of nitrogen, you might only apply half of it when you prepare your bed. And then you apply maybe another quarter of it and then the final quarter of it, you know, throughout the growing season. So that I've done the math here to kind of show that what that looks like and how that pounds of nitrogen translates into the amount of actual fertilizer that you add, which there's a little bit of extra math that you have to do with that. OK, so I can certainly help answer questions related to that when, when we get to the end or if you want to reach out to me later and I can walk you through this math because it looks complicated, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And I've done it in a somewhat straightforward way. So it's easier even for. Um, inexperienced gardeners or new new to gardening uh, growers to understand. But it is important. So I wanted to chat about it just, just for a little bit. Okay. Now, when it comes to plant spacing, this is where we're going to kind of go off the beaten path a little bit uh, because there it does really depend. And it, spacing is actually one of the most overlooked sort of cultural applications that you can apply to your garden. And it can actually... We're going to briefly talk about insects and diseases later, but if you get your bed spacing right, initially you can, or your plant spacing right, you can stave off a lot of, you know, weed pressure, disease, and uh, insect pressure down the road um, for, for several reasons. And we'll, we'll kind of get to that, but mainly disease and, and weed pressure, not as much insect. So really your spacing depends on, you know, what the width of your bed system is, you know, how much disease pressure you may end up getting how easy it is to actually cultivate in your garden, okay? Because if if you don't have a lot of weed pressure in a raised bed or garden, then you can actually consider kind of really cramming uh, onions in there, right? Depending, and if you're not that worried about bulb size. And bulb size is ultimately something that you can could consider as well. So here I've given you two numbers, and these are kind of the traditional uh, onion spacing numbers that you might find in any gardening book. So, you know, that classic sort of 10 to 18 inches between the rows. And then within the row for bulb onions, you want about an inch and a half to two inches between bulbs. And then for scallions, that's going to be about a quarter inch. Now, I don't plant onions that way. And you absolutely can. And I showed you an example in a raised bed earlier of, of what that might look like. I actually use something called the multi plant system. And there is some overlap with the square foot gardening method, which I'll show you an example of in a second, but this is a little bit different and you can do this. I, these pictures are going to be in soil block. So I have, I have soil block makers that I've used a lot over the years, but you can do these in plug trays or pots. It, it doesn't really matter, but with onions and the alien family, these multi-plant block systems, it works really well. And what I mean by that is that we're intentionally planting multiple seeds 
per container or plant hole, and we're not thinning them out. Okay, so this I'm going to play a little video over here so you can see what this looks like in my uh, transplant room. So these are actually scallions, that first tray. These are bulb onions, and these are bulb bulb onions. Oh, those might be scallions. These are bulb onions right here. So with bulb onions for the multi-plant system, I plant four seeds per block or cell. And for scallions, I plant anywhere from 10 to 12 seedlings per block or cell. And I do not thin them out. It's intentionally done that way. And then I space them out in this kind of gridded system. So a 10 inch by 10 inch grid for bulb onions, you'll see in a second, and a slightly closer spacing for scallions. Okay. So I want to set all that up for you because I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. So again, this is what I call, I use this on what we call a grid-based planting system using this bed preparation rake. So this is this is something we teach in our urban farmer training and you know market farmers use this, but this absolutely can be adopted by any backyard grower as well. And it does have some crossover with the square foot planting method that some of you might be familiar with, but it's slightly different. The grid-based planting system, again, requires you to have a bed preparation rake with these, uh, uh, they call it, they're called they calling PEX tubing. You can buy it at any hardware store. You cut them out and you can stick them on your rake. And essentially you can make different grids on a bed planting surface. And you can see here, I have a whole SOP planting system designed around this where each one has a specific rake code for a specific spacing uh, for different crops, okay? And with onions, it's it's a it's a six six rate code, but that means it's a ten inch by ten inch grid, and this will all become apparent here in a, in a second. With the square foot method, I actually really like the square foot method, and I'm sure some of you might use this in your raised beds. This was uh, Mel Bartholomew, who uh, famously he was an engineer, and then when he retired, he applied his engineering background to uh, more kind of mathematic. Um, visual planting system that's come to be known and popularized as the square foot planting method, where you essentially divide your raised bed or, or bed out into these square foot grids. And rather than planting on the crosshairs of where those grids are, which is what you're going to see with my system in a second, you actually subdivide a square foot out and you plant seeds or plants based on a spacing that you see here in this image on the right. So with onions, he actually recommended that you plant about 16 onion plants or onion seeds per square foot. Uh, and that, and I think that spacing would work out really well. The neat thing about the square foot method is that it's fun to experiment with. You can absolutely try these traditional spacings that you see here, these visual spacings. But if you think you could fit more than 16 onions in a square foot because you want a slightly smaller bulb and you're okay with that, you can experiment with it. And that's why I mentioned that spacing there's a lot of variability with it. It really depends on how you want to approach it and the unique context of your garden. Uh, so here are the onions. Here's a little video of me watering my onions before I get ready to set them out. So you can see they're a little bit unruly at this point. Um, I actually tend to trim mine back. So you see that in the garden literature quite a bit where they recommend, you know, once your plants get above like six to seven inches, you can trim them back or give them a haircut, if you will. Uh, and, and that kind of stimulates root growth and kind of keeps them at a uniform height and thickens them a little bit so they're they're ready to be set out. So it's really important that once you get ready to set them out, yes, you want to harden them off a little bit, but you definitely want to make sure they're nice and moist and, 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 and wet before you get ready to set them out. So here's what I mean by the grid-based system. And this is just a real short video to kind of illustrate that. So here's the bed prep rake. This is that 10 by 10 inch, the 6-6 six, six rate code in my plan. And all I'm doing is essentially creating a lined grid on my bed surface, okay? And again, you, you could kind of do this with the square foot method, but in this method, we're at, rather than planting within that square that you see, we're putting plants on each one of those intersections. So you're kind of creating this really easy visual uh, gridded planting pattern that you can plant on, okay? That's kind of what it looks like. And this is what it looks like when you lay the plants out. And here, here's a visual image of these multi-planted blocks uh, that I plant on this grid system. And again, this applies for both scallions and ball bunions. You can do it this way. So you can see these, these beautiful soil blocks of scallions that I have on this left-hand picture. I've got my grid all laid out. And all I do is simply throw them out on the grid and start planting them, okay? It's as simple as that with this system that you lay them out on the grid and you put them in the ground. It's, it, it really isn't any simpler than that. Here's a little time-lapse video of me doing it. 
These are actually the, the ball bunions in this case. These are not scallions. And you can see I'm intentionally planting clusters of ball bunions at a 10 by 10 inch spacing in three rows. And I'm gonna leave it that way until they mature. Now, what happens is, is you'll see an image of this, I think coming up. So here, here is kind of a picture of that same bed fully mature. Uh, that was kind of a quick walk by, I'll rewind here to see it. You can see here, the front of this picture, those are the scallions at a slightly uh, thicker spacing. And these are the bulb onions uh, closer down here, okay? Um, and what it happens is they, they grow in a cluster, right? They, and they kind of push each other away. So rather than having it in the single row that you saw in the earlier picture where you have a bulb every one to two and a half inches, you have them in clusters of maybe four to five and you give them a little bit more space in that grid system. And that's enough space for them to kind of push apart and still fully form a large bulge without, without having to thin them out. So it, this system works really well. If you're gonna start transplants, I highly recommend it because it's super easy to do. All you do is you fill your you know plug tray or you make your soil blocks and you sprinkle a, a few seeds in there, easy peasy. You don't have to do any thinning and, and then you grow them out from there and set those plants out into the garden based on your system. Versus if you direct seed it, right? Or you tried to grow individual onions and space them every inch to two inches, you can imagine that that'd be a little bit more labor intensive uh, I mean, especially if you're doing it on more of a, a larger scale, for sure. But even if you're only growing in a, you know, a 32 square foot raised bed like this, you see here, it can still be a little time consuming to thin and plant them out in this traditional way. I threw this slide in here about intercropping because I I, I want to make note that, you know, if you look back at, at this picture, you think, well, Zach, that's, you know, that's a pretty wide spacing and maybe those onions don't need all that space that entire time there in the bed. And you're absolutely right. Uh, if you're really savvy, you could implement something called intercropping where you might take up some of that extra space with quick growing crops like radishes are, is a great example. So these aren't radishes interplanted between onions, it's radishes interplanted between kale plants, but it's kind of the same idea. Essentially, you know, these radishes are interplanted with those kale plants and I'm gonna harvest those French breakfast radishes in about 20 days. And that'll be plenty of time for them to grow and harvest and not interfere with the growth of the kale plants. So if you really have limited garden space and you think like, oh, well, I like this grid-based system, but that's gonna take up a lot of valuable space in my raised bed, you can integrate it with an intercropping plan where you maybe plant some quick growing crops between your onions before they need the space and look like you know this video that you see here on, on the left-hand side, okay? So I just wanted to kind of illustrate that uh, to kind of show you, you know, what what that looks like. Uh, just really briefly, I want to talk about integrated pest management uh, when it comes to onions and we control insect and disease pressure. I'm not going to go into great detail here because we don't have time. But the thing about the onion family with weeds is that they are very poor weed competitors. Okay. Um, here is Angie actually out in our garden and this bed of leeks looks very clean, but what you're not seeing is that it probably took Angie 45 minutes, uh, to weed out that bed because it had really gotten overgrown with weeds and we let it get out of control. So part of the reason why I like that wide spacing with that multi-plant system is because it's really easy to get in there with a cultivator or by hand and, and keep those, that space between the onions, both in the rows and between the rows really weed free, especially from annual weeds to start. And then hopefully, you know, perennial grass weeds as you move into the season. Now you can use mulches, but I would definitely avoid using any black plastic or black fabric because, you know, onions are, they do like full sun, but they are a cooler season crop. So if you're planting them in black plastic for weed control, you know, they might not like that as much kind of middle of the season. When it comes to insect and disease pressure, I'm not going to say that Onion family is completely insect and disease free because they're not, but they tend to be an easier to grow crop because there's definitely fewer pests that you see on onion crops. And really that's why that good spacing and drainage from the cultural requirements at the beginning is so important for disease control. If you got good spacing and airflow and good drainage, you're going to avoid a lot of the rots and mildew issues that some in the onion family can um, can be a problem. And and especially if you're using transplants, if you start them off and you set them out, how I was showing you with those multi-block plants and you get them off to a good start, that's a, a great way to outcompete any disease pressure or potential insect 
uh, pressure periods. Now, some things to look out for are definitely the onion and seed corn maggot family. If you have any issues with those, they do like to feed on the shallow root system of onions. So if you have any onion seed corn maggot, you will have to address that. I've never had any problems with that in any of the gardens I've ever grown in, but it absolutely can be a problem for growers in the Midwest, as well as onion thrips. Here is actually a picture of onions I took from a student farm several years ago. And this kind of silver streaking pattern that you see here, it could be a number of different things. It could be downy mildew. It could also be the beginning of botrytis mold, but it also might be thrip damage. Um, this little kind of brown spot that you see here, that could be the beginning of something called purple blotch. So it's important to kind of look out for signs like this. Again, much fewer problems with onions if you get them off to a good start and you have good kind of cultural requirements at the beginning. But these are some of the things that you might want to look out for just in case when it comes to kind of an integrated pest management system. All right, let's wrap all this up with harvest and post-harvest. Uh, with scallions, you know, you can absolutely harvest them as needed, right? So at any size you prefer. If you prefer them skinnier than a pencil size, you can harvest them then. If you want them to get bigger, more pencil size, you can harvest them at that time. So this is why maybe doing a few plantings of scallions so you can have your ideal kind of continuous supply size of scallions might be a good idea. With the bulb onions, it's really just kind of a one and done planting. You get your planting in uh, in the late spring and you harvest them when it comes time, okay? And the, and the key thing to look for with bulb onions is when 50% or more of your planting, they start to fall over. And this is a great illustration of that in this picture. Uh, here is, in fact, that that planting from the stop motion earlier. You can see the multi-planted blocks. You can see three or four onions at each planting location. The necks have fallen over, and these are now ready to harvest. So once 50% or more of the necks are falling over, you can pull the onions. And the, it then comes the next most important step after you pull them, which is the curing phase. And if you want storage onions to last more than a few weeks, you need to put them through this curing process. And this can be very straightforward, especially because in July, July and August, we tend to not get as much frequent rain as we do in the spring and, and earlier part of the summer. So typically you wanna look for maybe a one to two week period where you can just simply harvest them and lay them out like you see here we did at the student farm. Ideally, if the temperatures are above 80 degrees, you know, within a week or two, they're gonna cure and dry up enough uh, so they can last long term in storage. Okay, so this is you know larger scale onion production. This is our onion crop from last year. Okay, and we just did it in our garage. Okay, you can do it outside, but you could do it in a garage or a closed space as long as you have you know above room temperature, approaching eighty degree temperatures for a week or two. That's those are good curing conditions for onions. And then once they reach that phase and those tops have dried out and they kind of look like this, then it's time to clean them up. And here's where you kind of clip them and you leave uh, about an inch or so of the top portion of them and you clean off the roots and then you can store them in boxes like you see here. Now, in terms of long-term storage, onions, the one of the reasons why they're such a fun crop to grow, because if you have a root cellar, I know not a lot of us do anymore, but if we have conditions where we can kind of create cold and dry, so think approaching 32 degrees, and around 65 to 70% relative humidity, and they're cured properly, yellow storage and red storage onions can last anywhere from four to six months, if not longer. So this is why onions can be such a satisfying crop to grow because they take a long time. You start them in February, you plant them out, you don't harvest them until, until July, you put them up for storage in, in late summer. But if you do it right and you have the good storage conditions, they'll last for more than a half a year. And if you planned it out right, you can have a, your own supply of onions. You don't need to buy them from the grocery store anymore. So I really have a lot of fun growing onions. And I've challenged myself over the years to try to grow as many onions as I can and for us to store and eat and us to not have to uh, buy onions from the grocery store anymore. Again, it's not that easy. It, you do need some of these longer term storage requirements. But what we're planning on doing actually this year at our house is we already have the 65, 70 percent relative humidity in our basement. All we need is the corner off a room, kind of create a little root cellar space down there where we can get some of that cold air from into the basement. And we should have the right conditions for uh, storing onions for a long period of time. 
Now, the one gap I want to reference in closing is this overwintered onion period. And this is where that variety forum and growing the mess sets comes into play. And a lot, what you can do with this to kind of bridge that gap with when the storage onions run out and when the new onions start is to grow overwintered onions. And this is where you start them kind of in around the time you start garlic, kind of mid to late October, you plant them out as sets as you see here in this picture. And then you need like a low tunnel or a cold frame or something to protect them over winter. And they overwinter really nicely and they get a real quick head start like starting now once the winter period is over. And you can get some, you know, spring, what they call spring onions, kind of in that, you know, late May to early June phase, you know, which might correspond with roughly when you started to run out of storage onions from the previous year. So if you if you get really into growing onions, storage onions and overwintered onions, you can almost bridge that gap to have a continuous supply of onions um, uh, year round without having to go to the grocery store. So I'll close off by saying love growing onions. Great, fun crop to grow. Um, you know, it sounds complicated to start, but it actually is pretty easy once you kind of get into it. Here are some of my favorite varieties to try. Uh, Patterson is a great long day yellow storage onion. And Rosa di Milano is this new long day storage onion that Johnny's developed that I just love. This is a picture of Rosa di Milano at the top. Uh, great storage onion, a great cooking onion. And then my new kind of favorite uh, unknown all-star onion are the Cipollini onion. So these are the milder, sweeter, flat onions that you see here at the bottom right hand corner. These are great caramelizers if you like caramelized onions. The Cipollina onions are by far my favorite varieties to grow. And you can grow them in the identical fashion as you grow uh, the bulb onions in. So I want to thank you so much. Here's all my good contact info. Here's a QR code if you're interested in Master Urban Farmer training program. Here's my Instagram handle and Urban Ag Connect vlog handle if you want to check out Instagram stuff and uh, my YouTube channel where I do some vlog stuff. So with that, I know we were maybe a little bit over, but it looks like we still have about 10 minutes uh, for, for some Q&A. So I'd love to open it up. It looks like we only have 12 of us in. So if we want to just raise hand, unmute, or Casey, however you want to handle it, I, I, I can stick around and, and have some more dialogue. Yeah, that sounds great. I think um, just with the smaller group, if folks want to um, go ahead and come off mute and ask any questions that they might have, um, it might be a, a great time to do that. Um, and really appreciate the awesome overview today too, um, Zachary. Thank you so much. Um, I see Raul, yeah. um, you have your hand raised, so go ahead. Hi, uh, my name's Anna and I wanted to know, I have limited space in my raised beds. Mm -hmm. What other vegetables grow well with onions? So in that kind of intercrop, intercrop sort of system that I, that I was referencing there. Um, so really anything like the onion, like the radishes that grow really quick like that. So we're talking crops that mature in that kind of 28 to like 35 day period. So that could be anything from radishes to even like baby salad greens, baby spinach, things like that. You know, feel free to kind of fill up that space between your onion rows. If you're going to grow them, like I was showing you in that multi-plant system, uh, feel free to fill it up with quick growing crops because you'll be able to pull those out and harvest those and enjoy them um, and still give your onion space to, you know, uh, further the rest of the season. So, so that, so that's, those are just a couple ideas. You wouldn't want to grow anything that's going to take longer than maybe like 35 to 40 days because that then it's going to start interfering with that space and, and light requirements that those onions need. But radishes are probably my favorite example because those French breakfast radishes, if you love radishes, I mean, you can get those harvested in like 20 days and, you know, you could plop a couple plantings of those, you know, in during that period when those onions are getting established. No problem. Great question. Awesome. Thank you for the question. And I see um, Janice has her hand raised. Uh, yeah, um, I, I hear that alfalfa pellets are very high in nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Would that be something that we could, that I could put on my raised bed to, you know, give it enough nitrogen? Absolutely. It, it's possible. So I'm going to get back to that slide because you bring up a great point. And I, and I want to illustrate this just really quickly in that slide. So here at the very bottom where it says in practice, the important number you want to pay attention to in blood meal is that 13, that, that represents 13% of the weight of that fertilizer is in nitrogen. So the thing about alfalfa pellets is that alfalfa 
in pellet form is probably somewhere around four to five percent nitrogen. So it's a, roughly a third to half of what blood meal is. And then you run into the further problem with an organic nitrogen source like alfalfa is that it takes, it's going to take a little bit of time for the soil microbiology to work on that alfalfa to actually release the nitrogen. So what I would say is that alfalfa in pellet form and even in kind of uh, a meal form, because you can get it in kind of meal granu uh, non-pelletized form, is that it's, it's a great kind of longer term uh, nitrogen feeder, but maybe it's a supplemental feeder. So I might combine alfalfa with something like blood meal or maybe something that has a little bit higher, maybe more of a, like a synthetic nitrogen source, if you're, if you're okay with that, uh, to kind of complement each other. Because what the research is actually showing us is if we can be sort of growing philosophy agnostic or neutral, uh, combining synthetic and organic sources together to meet our nitrogen needs is actually optimal because we're providing some of the carbon in the alfalfa that the, the soil life needs, as well as some nitrogen, as well as the boot, the more nitrogen that the crop is actually going to need uh, to really get it to its true potential. Okay. You absolutely can get away with just using something like alfalfa meal as a fertilizer for a nitrogen source, but you just may experience slightly smaller yields than you would if you focused on something that was a more readily available a nitrogen source. And, and I often cite blood meal if you want to use a more organic nitrogen source, because that 13% uh, nitrogen from blood meal is probably the highest percentage and quickest available nitrogen source from an, a quote unquote organic nitrogen source. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you, what do you, uh, what is the soil you're starting the seeds in when you started your onions this year? Oh, great, great question. I didn't, I don't think I, I referenced that. So I, so this mix that you see here, like in this video in the soil blocks or my wind strip trays, for instance, I tend to use, I make my own custom transplant potting soil mix, uh, but you absolutely can use any sort of potting soil, peat, queer fiber, wood fiber based, you know, whatever potting soil mixture uh, that you use to start seeds from the, you know, hardware store, garden center, anything like that could work. Um, you know, you want if, so the one thing though I'll reference is if you, since I'm referencing a six to eight week period to grow these transplants, you probably want a media that does have some fertility in it. So if you don't want to add all the fertility at the transplant stage or seedling stage in your water, right, as a soluble fertilizer, then you want something that has some fertility in it. So just when you're selecting it at the garden center, you know, some of those potty mixes have little to no fertility. Those are more like the seed starting mixes versus the ones that have maybe some compost or other fertilizers incorporated. Uh, that will get you kind of, you know, to that six to eight week stage, like you see here, if that makes sense. I actually tend to, when I make my custom mixes, I make kind of a, a, a kind of a medium octane blend, if, if I can call it that, to <laughs> where there's not no fertility in it, but there's not so much fertility in it that I have problems germinating seeds in it. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone rather than having a seed starting mix and then having to like use a separate mix to grow the plants out, like you see in this image. I just, I like to have a mix that has enough fertility in it where the seeds can start. It doesn't burn the plants, but it has enough fertility to get it to like six to eight weeks, right? So that's, that would be my general recommendation. If, if you don't make your own, you know, any of the commercial blends that you see at the garden centers uh, would work. And, and most of the time, the staff there are knowledgeable enough to kind of know the difference between those mixes, whether it's like, pure seed starting versus more like a potting soil mix. So this is closer to like a potting soil mix that you see here. How many of you have ever used soil blocks that you see here? Does anyone grow in soil blocks or has anyone ever tried that? No. It, it's an interesting system uh, because you can grow really high quality transplants and you, you, you buy these 10, 20 trays that you see here that I have them situated in. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to worry about buying, you know, uh, plug trays or inserts ever again. You, it's essentially an injection mold system where it's a, uh, you get the mix wet and you push the blocker into the mix and you inject out these these little soil blocks that you grow in. I love it. It's a system I've used for 15 years. I've since moved on to this new system called they're called wind strip trays, 
And they're very, very expensive trays, but they are indestructible trays that will last forever. And they're actually like plug trays, but they emulate soil blocking, meaning that they have kind of slits in the side and really wide bottoms. So you don't get uh, roots root circling. The nice thing about the soil blocks, if you saw from this image, this image on the left here, notice how the, the roots aren't wrapping around each other. If if you grew these in a plug tray, in a plastic pl plug tray at this stage, the roots would be completely root bound and wrapping around each other. With soil blocks, they tend to grow straight down. And then when they reach the edge, they, they really don't grow into each other that much. And wind strip trays kind of emulate that in a plug tray form, but they're very expensive. And there's only actually one company out there that sells them. So I can I can recommend them, but when you see the sticker price on on wind strip trays, you yeah, you might look elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. Any other questions? Uh, while Samantha's I'm... got her hand up. Samantha, you yeah. want to provide? Yes, I have a question about scallions. Um, yeah. What is the benefit to succession planting them if you can just trim them and eat and they grow back? So, well, so, okay. So they don't, when I mentioned the trimming in this, in this previous slide right here, what I meant was you, you I'm kind of trimming the tops back when they're in the, the transplant form like this, before we set them out into the garden, mm -hmm. once you set them out into the garden and they grow out. Okay. They look small now, but once you see this video on the left-hand side, that the, the onions in the front, those are scallions. And this is actually, you know, scallions that are probably, they're edible, but they're probably beyond the stage, that kind of pencil size stage that we're so used to buying them in the, in the grocery store. So if you plant all your scallions at once like this, and you don't use them all like in a period of time, then they'll just get really big and overgrown and they won't be that kind of small pencil size anymore. Whereas the okay. bulb onions, you, pl you plant them once and you just, you get that whole planting a bulb out and you harvest the whole thing. With the scallions, you can if you kind of space it out over a few weeks each each planting, then you can kind of have more of a continuous supply of the smaller scallions. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. is that true That's for green onions as well? The you know, green onion scallion, same thing. I yeah. I, I use those yeah. terms okay. interchangeably. Yeah, yep. just making sure. Yep. So yep. Um, I, one one quick question about um, leeks. Um, yeah. Because I, I know you had the beginning uh, about that. Uh, we will be selling leeks at our um, plant sale. So we'll have start oh, cool. for folks. So were you, um, those you were taking individual plants and putting yep. them very deeply planted. Um, so exactly. when I buy my leeks this year, I, I want to get it right. So I, I just, so if we're, if we're selling them in a four pack, I can't remember how they're, how they're grown um, at the plant sale. Um, if you get them in this clump, you're putting just one in. Yep, exactly. For, so this, these two, Im, these two images are my, two different uh, experience stages of mine with leek growing. Okay. This picture in the top middle, these are actually kind of somewhat poorly grown leek seedlings. Okay. If you notice, I pause the stop motion image down here. It's hard to see, but you see this the 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 leak that I just planted right there. That leak is actually almost pencil size. So I got okay. better at growing my leak plants, but still, yes, they were just kind of grown in this massive cluster like this. Okay. And I and I and I grew them right to where they're more pencil size, and I just kind of pulled them apart. And then I'm planting okay. individual leaks in those kind of nine inch deep holes like that. Right. Yep. Great. Exactly. And you, and don't be afraid to mishandle them because it, onions, it kind of, it's kind of like the the brassica family too. Like if you've ever handled like cabbage or um, broccoli transplants, you know, I said you got to throw them against the wall and they wouldn't be any worse for the wear. You don't want to do that, but you certainly could, you don't need to be afraid to kind of rip them apart and handle them roughly. Uh, and that would be the same thing for leeks as well. They can take it. Okay, well, um, I think we could go on and on um, <laughs> about this whole allium and um, family of of plants here. And this was just such a deep dive. Um, and we really haven't done this often um, with our lectures. But when we do, I've been sitting on the edge of my seat the entire time. And I know everybody on here has also been 
just enthralled. So um, the level of knowledge and everything you brought um, was just so wonderful, Zach. So thank you for putting this yeah. together for us. And I'm thrilled that we recorded so we can share it with others. And um, I have the link that you posted and um, uh, uh, from Johnny's. And then um, we do have your email. If you want me to share that, I can um, certainly send that out to folks as well. But um, thank you so much for um, being with us tonight. And I know the the folks that are on here really appreciate everything you shared. So yeah, it was it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I can send if you if you all would like a PDF of the slides, I certainly can send them off. Uh, and you could share that PDF if you want, you know, some of the pictures you see, I had them stacked on top of each other. So you couldn't see all of them, but you definitely could see, you know, like the fertility recommendations and varieties and stuff like that. 